Thanks for joining me in this lecture. This lecture will cover what's in the course. Welcome to Applied Machine Learning with BigQuery on Google's Cloud Platform. Let's talk about what's in the course. BigQuery is Google's serverless, highly scalable, enterprise data warehouse. Before BigQuery became a cloud service, it was used internally at Google millions of times a day. Before it was BigQuery, it was called Dremel. Dremel was a query-like service that allows you to run SQL-like queries against very, very large data sets and get accurate results in mere seconds. You just need a basic knowledge of SQL to query extremely large data sets in an ad hoc manner. At Google, engineers and non-engineers alike, including analysts, tech support staff, and technical account managers, use the technology thousands of times a day. BigQuery is the public implementation of Dremel. In this course, you'll learn how to use BigQuery to massage and navigate data sets at scale. BigQuery has many use cases, and this course will focus on how to get the most out of BigQuery as a machine learning engineer. Most applied machine learning is supervised. That means machine learning models are built against existing data sets. In the applied space, these data sets can be massive. Most organizations simply don't have the hardware resources to build their models against a data set with a billion rows or more. For comparison, BigQuery can return 35 billion rows in 10 seconds. BigQuery provides machine learning engineers a location to house their data sets regardless of scale. If you want to build a model against a petabyte of data, BigQuery can handle it. BigQuery uses a different approach to return data to the end user. BigQuery stores data in columnar storage, which means it separates a record into column values and stores each value in different storage volumes, whereas traditional databases normally store the whole record on one volume. This technique is called columnar storage and it's been used in traditional data warehouse solutions. And the course will learn the advantages of columnar storage and dig deeper into BigQuery's architectural details. And the course will learn how to use BigQuery based on real-world case studies. These case studies will walk you through the end-to-end -end process of working with BigQuery. You'll learn how real-world models are built from end-to-end. -end. The phrase end-to-end -end simply means working through the sundry steps in the machine learning pipeline. You'll learn how to source data, clean the data, and finally model the data to create a highly predictive model. Throughout the course, the focus will be on how to leverage BigQuery to build your models. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. Google is a data-driven company. If you're trying to make a point or start a project and you have the data to back up your idea, there's a good chance your idea will be accepted. Big data is a fuzzy term and that was done deliberately. For most of us, big data is just more data than you can handle using traditional tools like relational databases. Now, you can house a petabyte of data on commodity hardware. However, querying that data isn't going to be a lot of fun. At this level, the size of your data is a pain point, and this data would be considered big data. Regardless of the technical minutia behind the definition, working with large data sets is challenging, and Google helped pioneer many of the approaches used today to combat those hurdles. Google has had two major periods of data enlightenment, the first period between 2000 and 2006. During that period, Google produced several technologies that built the foundation for big data. The second period, after 2006 to present, has been to enhance and polish the tools they originally created. The technologies created during these two periods continue to be used as a foundation for Google's data-driven approach. Machine learning is one of the most sought-after careers on the planet, and that's not just within the IT space, that's everywhere. I should add here that the single most sought-after job in the world is that of the data engineer. That statistic is from Google. It's not something I just fabricated. Machine learning lives under the AI umbrella. Almost all applied machine learning is data-driven. As an aside, the words applied machine learning simply mean real-world machine learning, not machine learning research or anything else at the collegiate level. Machine learning is simply finding patterns in the data we can use later to make predictions using fresh data. Fresh data is data the model has never seen before. Machine learning engineers need to be able to build their models against highly structured data sets, the very kind of data sets that BigQuery thrives at storing. Now, BigQuery is a Google Cloud product. In order to use it, you're going to have to interact with the Google Cloud platform. Most professionals shorten the Google Cloud platform to GCP for brevity. Going forward, I'll often refer to the Google Cloud platform simply as GCP. In this section, you're going to set up a GCP account so we can use it with BigQuery. Now, it's important to point out here the course will only focus on services specific to using BigQuery. GCP is very large, and our focus for the entirety of this course will only be on BigQuery. 
Thanks for joining me on this introduction to applied machine learning with BigQuery on Google's Cloud Platform. This lecture will introduce scaling for big data at Google. The more data you have, the more resources you'll need in order to work with that data in a timely manner. Now, I'm using the term resources here strictly from a hardware perspective, CPU, memory, and disk. There are two ways to scale out your hardware resources. The first way is up and the second way is out. Scaling up means buying larger servers with more resources. Scaling out means using lots of hardware and spreading the load across many servers. Google initially rejected scaling up because of cost. Buying thousands of tier one servers is expensive. The question became, wouldn't it be more cost effective to purchase 50 smaller servers for the cost of that one big one and spread the load out across those 50 servers? The answer was yes. However, it does mean you'll have to design your applications for massive parallelization. Scaled up servers provide no redundancy. If you spend $100,000 on one super server, you'll need a second one as a standby in case the first one fails. That's an incredible amount of money wasted on idle, expensive resources just sitting there waiting to be used. Additionally, vertically scaled boxes have hard limitations. You only have so many slots for CPU and memory. If your server runs out of memory or your CPU is pinned, then it's time to buy another pair of servers. Once Google settled on scaling out, there was no turning back. They began building their entire data stack using the scale out model. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. This lecture will introduce several of Google's guiding principles for scaling. Let's take a look at the evolution of the big data stack at Google. Between 2000 and 2004, Google began creating real world approaches for managing their ever expanding big data universe. Initially, Google wrote down some guiding principles. The first major principle was that anything could fail at any time and that the software design had to account for that. At most companies, when a database server fails, it's a critical event. The same thing can be said about a switch dying. The second guiding principle has to do with hardware vendors. The term often used here is commodity hardware. Commodity hardware simply means computer that is affordable and easy to obtain. Using this approach, Google didn't get locked into any one vendor and could easily switch vendors without incurring any penalties. If you're using Dell servers and they become too expensive, you simply switch to HP. Lastly, hardware is expensive. The guiding principle for all applications must be to scale out and not up. These principles inspired new architectures and cut costs significantly. Google designed three key technologies that moved them towards the scaled out revolution. The first one was GFS. This is the Google file system. GFS was a distributed cluster-based file system. The data is stored in multiple locations and is still available regardless of disk failure. The second technology was MapReduce. MapReduce gained massive popularity due to its ability to split and process terabytes of data in parallel, achieving quicker results. MapReduce facilitates concurrent processing by splitting petabytes of data into smaller chunks and then processing them in parallel on Hadoop commodity servers. In the end, it aggregates all the data from multiple servers to return a consolidated output back to the application. The next big technology was Bigtable. Bigtable uses structured storage and scales out to multiple servers. Bigtable data is also replicated. Therefore, a single or even multiple hardware failures doesn't cause data loss. Using these three technologies, Google replaced most of their off-the-shelf software used to run their business. This was the Google Data Stack 1.0. Over the coming years, Google built their organization on top of these technologies and moved in the direction of their initial tenant, scale it out. Colossus replaced GFS. GFS didn't scale very well, and its fault tolerant had a lot to be desired. Now, much of the architectural details of Colossus are not publicly disclosed. However, it is the underlying disk subsystem on which much of Google is built. For example, BigQuery relies on Colossus. Each Google data center has its own Colossus cluster, and each Colossus cluster has enough disks to give every BigQuery user thousands of dedicated disks at one time. Colossus also handles replication, recovery, and distributed management, so there's no single point of failure. Colossus is fast enough to allow BigQuery to provide similar performance to many in-memory databases. But leveraging much cheaper yet highly parallelized, scalable, durable, and performant infrastructure. The second technology for Datastack 2.0 was Megastore, a highly distributed NoSQL type data store. When data is written to one data center, 
it's also immediately replicated to another geographically dispersed one. Lastly, there's Spanner. Spanner is Google's scalable, geographically distributed, and synchronous replicated database. Again, it uses Colossus to distribute data at a global scale and support externally consistent distributed transactions. Although Spanner is relational and designed to be for OLTP, it can also handle in database operational analytics. The new stack was built to address many of the problems that version 1.0 suffered from. While the Big Data Stack 2.0 still has some rough edges, no other company on the planet allows you to move big data around at the same speed you move smaller data sets around. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. In order to use Google Cloud Services, you'll need an account on GCP. Let's start by navigating to a browser. We could type out the entire name, but Google understands the GCP acronym, which means all we have to do is type three letters, GCP. Once the search is completed, GCP is our first result. Let's click on that result. You're taken to the GCP signup screen. Click on the Try Free button. Google recognizes one of my accounts and suggests I use it. I decline because I've created a new account for this course. You must have a Gmail account to use GCP. Once I type in the account I'd like to use and my password, the account on GCP is ready to go. Now, you might be tempted to gloss over the information on the right hand side, but it's important. You're given a $300 credit to use on GCP, and the auto charge feature won't kick in without your confirmation. OK, let's agree to the terms and continue. On the next screen, Google wants some information about where you live. Most of my information autofills. The last piece of information you'll need is a credit card. Once you've given Google a valid credit card, you're passed to the welcoming screen. Congratulations, you're ready to navigate the entire GCP landscape. More important, you're ready to use BigQuery. The screen you're viewing now is a GCP home screen. All right, the next thing I want to show you is billing, because no matter where I've worked, everyone's wanted to know what their bill was going to be. And more importantly, they've wanted updates along the way. So let's go find out how to do that. We come over here to the navigation menu, we click on it. So here is our overview of our billing account. Now, we really only have two sections here. We have the credits, which we've talked about a little earlier. You're given $300 of credits when you sign up, and it lasts a year. And it's letting me know I also have 340 days remaining. So we have projects linked to this billing account. Now, in a second, I'm going to show you how to set up an alert. However, it's important to understand that alerts are just that. There are alerts sent to the billing account email that let you know you're billing along the way. They're not going to shut down the account once you reach your maximum. However, if you'd like to disable billing because you've hit a limit, you can come here to any of your projects and let's disable for a cloud. So we'll click on that little ellipsis and we'll hit disable billing. And we're going to get a little message here that says, hey, when you disable billing on this project, it's going to shut down all the services associated with this project. So just as long as you know that, you can go ahead and disable billing and you won't be charged anymore on that project. I want to cancel out of that. And I want to navigate to budgets and alerts. So let's click on budgets and alerts. We're going to create a budget. And to do that, we simply click on create budget. In the budget, we need to give our budget a name. We'll call this Mike's, can't type, budget. And on our next drop down, it's saying, what account do you want associated with it? It can be the entire billing account, or it can be an individual project, all right? I want to do it on the entire billing account. Next, we want a specified amount. So let's put in $1,000. And when I type $1,000, you will see the budget alerts that are created down here. Now, you can add and alter these, but 50 and 90 and 100% are good budget alerts, all right? So here we have this cost after credit. And if you click on that, it says, this is a cost after credit for the total minus any applicable credit. So if you want that, you simply click on that. Either way, whether you click on that or not, I really encourage you to set up billing alerts, even if it's just your account. Let's go ahead and save. And now we've set up a budget that will send the billing administrator an email once those targets are hit, the 50, 90, and 100% targets of the specified amount. To delete it, pretty straightforward. You click there. Up here, we have delete, and we will be able to delete that budget. So let's go ahead and delete that budget. And now we have no budgets. All right, we've gone over the basics of billing, and we set up a simple alert to alert us 
when specific targets are hit. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. In this lecture, let's discuss what will be covered in this section. By 2012, there were 100 billion searches done every month on Google. Trying to keep up that amount of data was a laborious task. Initially, Google spent a lot of money on hardware for relational databases, yet it was still hard to get any real-time analysis on their data. In this section, you'll find out why this led to the creation of BigQuery. If your data doesn't live in BigQuery, you can't query it. BigQuery only stores and operates on structured datasets. A table in a relational database is an example of an object with fixed schema. When a table is created, you define what gets stored in that structure. In this section, the cloud storage system will be covered. Recall that Google's infrastructure decision was to scale out and not up. When you run a query on BigQuery, your query is likely to be run on massive clusters. The number of processor cores on these clusters is likely to be in the thousands, and the number of disks in the hundreds of thousands. This section will cover parallel execution of your BigQuery queries. Most of the interaction you'll have with BigQuery in this course will be via the cloud interface. With the UI, you'll be able to create and execute queries, create tables, share datasets, and export your data. In this section, the basics of navigation via the web interface will be covered. BigQuery isn't an isolated tool at Google. BigQuery is built on top of other technologies like Bigtable and Colossus. This section will uncover some of the architectural details behind BigQuery. For example, BigQuery metadata is stored in Megastore. However, the actual data is stored on Colossus. The section will also cover the foundation of BigQuery navigation. You'll complete several demonstrations using the web UI. Sections will build on one another, so I'd highly recommend you move through the course in a serial fashion. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. In this lecture, let's define what BigQuery is. Google's exponential data growth was causing problems. Google needed a tool that enabled interactive queries over big data. Yes, Google invented MapReduce. However, MapReduce is a batch-oriented technology. Getting answers from MapReduce jobs takes a long time. Google needed something more interactive. BigQuery as a tool used to enable interactive queries over datasets at scale. The term is scale invariant. That simply means that BigQuery should operate the same way whether you're querying 50 rows or 50 billion rows. Now, obviously, there's going to be some time difference between the 50 row table and the 50 billion row table. However, the 50 billion row table in BigQuery still returns results to you in minutes. Google's need for a tool that enabled interactive query analytics over large data sets led to the creation of Dremel, which gave Google employees the ability to run queries over very large data sets. The popularity of Dremel at Google persuaded Google to provide the service to their customers. That service is called BigQuery. The default language in the world of relational databases is SQL. One of the great things about SQL is its ubiquity within the organization. At most companies, it's quite common for people outside of IT to be familiar with SQL and use it to ask questions of their data. Even though BigQuery uses a non-standard dialect, it's still SQL. That means the learning curve for anyone who knows SQL will be short. Most relational databases can take advantage of parallelism. However, they often parallelize the queries across multiple processors, rather than taking advantage of multiple processors for a single query. The Dremel engine parallelizes SQL execution across thousands of machines. With Dremel, if you want your queries to run faster, you simply throw more computers at it. At Google, one of Dremel's performance goals was to return a terabyte of data in a second. They've accomplished that and more. If you've worked in the world of relational databases at all, you'll know that kind of speed is insane. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. In this lecture, let's discuss the type of data BigQuery stores. BigQuery stores structured data. An example of structured data is an Excel spreadsheet or a table in a relational database. An example of unstructured data is an HTML file. While an HTML file does have some structure, it takes quite a bit of effort to coerce it into the structure required by the table object in BigQuery. BigQuery tables are made up of columns or fields of structured data. Like a relational database, each field has a name and a data type that indicates what kind of data can be stored in that field. The fields can house primitives or record types. A primitive is an integer, a string, or a Boolean flag. Unlike a relational database, these fields can hold record types. BigQuery supports nested records within tables. These records can either be a single record or contain repeated values. Nested structures are essentially pre-joined tables. 
And because the data is stored columnarly, if you don't reference the nested column, there's no added expense to the query. BigQuery supports three types of tables. Native tables, which are tables backed by native storage. External tables, tables backed by storage external to BigQuery. And lastly, views, which are virtual tables defined by a SQL query. Next up are datasets. A dataset is a container within a specific project. Datasets are top-level containers that are used to organize and control access to tables and views. A table or view must belong to a dataset, so you need to create at least one dataset before loading data into BigQuery. Lastly, these datasets owned by a user or a group are organized into projects. We call it the project as a single billing entity used in GCP. In this lecture, let's discuss parallelization of BigQuery queries. When you execute a single query that takes one second, in most relational database systems, you occupy a single core. Therefore, if you have four cores, you can run four queries at once. Amazon's Redshift provides you with the ability to run queries in parallel, however, on a fixed number of cores. BigQuery is architected on a different paradigm. A single query in BigQuery might run on thousands of cores in parallel. If you run the same four queries discussed above, those queries on BigQuery might run on thousands of cores. The Dribbble engine can pipeline queries so that when some queries are waiting on I.O., others will use available cores. With BigQuery, allowing your queries to run on all the hardware on a cluster maximizes performance significantly compared to the traditional query core approach. One of the core architectural aspects of BigQuery is multi-tenancy. That simply means many customers can run queries at the same time on the same hardware. One of the reasons BigQuery can keep up with a high utilization is taking advantage of varied data usage patterns. Heavy BigQuery usage during Australia's core hours isn't heavy usage during Atlanta's core hours. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. In this lecture, let's take a look at the anatomy of the interface. Before we dive into the BigQuery interface, let's create a shortcut so we don't have to type the URL every time we want to use GCP. I'm a Windows person, so this trick only applies to Windows environments. Let's navigate to GCP by typing in console.cloud.google.com. Once our page paints, let's navigate to the right-hand side of our browser, which in this case is Edge. Click on the ellipses and choose Pin this page to taskbar. Once that's completed, we have a new shortcut on our taskbar. Now, when you want to navigate to GCP, just click on your shortcut. Next, let's cover the interface. Let's click on the menu button and then navigate to BigQuery. The interface you are looking at is a new one that's currently in beta. Let's go ahead and navigate to the classic interface. The classic interface simply isn't as clean or compartmentalized as a new one. Therefore, let's stick with the new one. The UI consists of three core panes. The pane on the left-hand side is the navigation pane. There are five sections. The first is query history. This is a history of all the queries you've run on BigQuery. This is project dependent. Next is saved queries. You can save your queries for safekeeping and then navigate to this tab when you want to retrieve them. Next is Job History. The Job History section displays your project's load, export, and copy jobs. The Transfer section opens the BigQuery Data Transfer UI. The Resource section contains a list of pen projects. Expand a project to view the data sets and tables you have access to. A search box is also available in the Resources section that allows you to search the resource by name or label. The next pane is the Query Editor. This is where you craft your queries. You can toggle the Query Editor off and on via the Hide Editor button. The third pane is the Details pane. This pane contains information about the query you've executed. It's also where the results of your queries are displayed. All right, so here we are in BigQuery. Let's go ahead and hide our editor so we have some more real estate so we can see our query history. Query history is specific to the project. Now, what does that mean? Here we have a whole bunch of queries that I've run in my first project. But if we navigate to this, let's click on it and choose a different project. Let's choose a cloud. You will see when we do that, there is no query project history because I haven't run any here. Let's go back to my first project where all the history is. And now you can see that we have the history specific to this project, this my first project. 
Notice that there are two kinds of histories here. You have personal histories, which are all the queries you've run. Then you have project history. These are all the queries everyone has run that are on the project. If you wanted to find someone that isn't me, let's say that there are other team members and you want to see one of their queries, you would simply come up here and type user email. And let's say I'm the only one, so let's go ahead and hunt down mine. Now there's going to be no difference, but I just want to show you so you have an idea. And this would find all the queries associated with this user. Let's go ahead and navigate back to that. Let's click on personal histories. Let's go back and filter some queries again. If I wanted to find a query with Mike in it, I would simply click on query text. I would navigate to the end of that and I would type Mike and then hit enter. And that would return every query with Mike in it. You can see here we have one with Mike GA in it. Down here we have one where name equals Mike. Now let's say I wanted to open up any of these queries. Let's navigate down to one that was a while ago. Well, not really a while ago, but on 121. Let's navigate over here and click on that. And this will load the query in the query editor for us to run. Let's go ahead and execute it. Now you see that on the run button, we have run, and then we have this little drop down. This little drop down simply allows us to execute something that's highlighted. So instead of executing the entire query, we could come up here and select that. And if we come down here, it will show us the run selected now because we've selected part of the query and left some of it off. All right, let's deselect that and go ahead and execute our query. And now if we just executed a query that we had saved in our query history. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. All right, let's go ahead and look at the Google Cloud Console specific to BigQuery. The Cloud Console has three main screens shown on screen. The navigation menu contains a list of BigQuery resources that you can view. The SQL Workspace section displays data sets, tables, views, and other BigQuery resources. This is where you create and run queries, work with tables and views, see your BigQuery job history, and perform other common BigQuery tasks. The Transfer section opens up BigQuery Data Transfer Service page. The Scheduled Query section displays scheduled queries. The Reservation section displays slot commitments, reservations, and reservation assignments. And the BI Engine section opens up the BI Engine Query page. To collapse the navigation menu so that the icons are visible, you can hide the BigQuery navigation menu. All right, next up is the Explorer panel. The Explorer panel is visible when you select SQL workspaces in the navigation menu. This panel contains a list of current projects plus any pinned projects. To view any data sets you have in the project, expand to the project. To view tables, views, and functions in the data set, expand the data sets. There's also a search box where you can search for resources by name. You can use project, data set, table, or view name. The details panel shows you information about BigQuery resources. When you select a data set, table view, or other resource in Explorer panel, the Cloud Console opens up a new tab in the details panel with information about that resources. From these tabs, you can create tables and views, modify table schemas, export data, and perform other functions. BigQuery is a lot of things. In this lecture, let's take a look at what BigQuery isn't. When you're making recommendations for BigQuery use cases, it's a good idea to know what BigQuery excels at and what it might not be best suited for. BigQuery has some things in common with OLTP databases. However, it's not really suited for common OLTP applications. Most OLTP systems have lots of small, row-level updates. BigQuery almost supports append-only and truncate operations. These type of row-level updates occur frequently in OLTP databases, so trying to use BigQuery for an OLTP application probably won't end well. If BigQuery isn't a relational database, then it must be a NoSQL database. BigQuery uses a dialect of SQL, so it can't be considered NoSQL. A NoSQL database, as its name implies, is a data management system that doesn't use SQL to retrieve data. In many cases, they are key pair value storage systems, but not always. In order to scale BigQuery more efficiently, Google made it more difficult to update tables and made it easier to retrieve that data from those tables. If it's not relational nor SQL, then maybe it's MapReduce. MapReduce is one of the core technologies for making computations over big data. However, MapReduce is a batch-oriented technology and BigQuery is an interactive one. Batch-oriented means the jobs run over a period of time before the results are available. Additionally, BigQuery doesn't use any component of MapReduce under the hood. BigQuery is closer to an OLAP database. Many of the use cases that are designed for OLAP systems 
will most likely be appropriate for BigQuery. Additionally, Data Warehouse is in the definition Google uses for BigQuery. Google's CAN definition for BigQuery was recently updated. This is a new definition. Google says it's a fast, highly scalable, cost-effective, and fully managed, here it comes, cloud data warehouse for analytics with built-in machine learning. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. BigQuery is comprised of many other components. Let's examine a few of the core components in this lesson. BigQuery doesn't live in isolation. It's not an independent tool. It's made up of many other components in addition to its core features. How does BigQuery relate to other services or technologies within Google? BigQuery stores data about your tables in Megastore. Now, it doesn't store the data in Megastore, just the metadata. Metadata is data about data. Megastore is a globally available NoSQL type data storage system. Google systems are often highly layered. Each layer adds something the lower layer doesn't. For example, Megastore is built on top of Bigtable. The bad part about Bigtable is that the data in Bigtable is only stored in one data center. If that data center goes down for any reason, then your data is unavailable. So, in order to handle the shortcomings of Bigtable, Megastore replicates your data asynchronously to other data centers, so your data is always available. In the future, this metadata will likely move to Spanner, which is the next generation of highly available transactional databases at Google. If your data isn't stored in Megastore or Spanner, then where is it? Your data is stored in Colossus. Colossus is Google's globally distributed data storage platform that is the disk subsystem for much of Google's platforms. Data within each Colossus cell is replicated several times. This prevents your data from being inaccessible in the event of a data center failure. Colossus provides BigQuery the ability to read data in parallel. Because data is stored on many disks, your data can be read from multiple locations. Unlike relational databases that store disk in rows, BigQuery stores the data in columns. BigQuery has its own algorithm for storing data in these columns called Column IO. This not only improves performance, but allows you to be charged based on the data you return. One of the most overlooked aspects of many architectures are the network connections. The larger the network, the harder it is to move data around quickly. Google often has a high degree of secrecy over several of their architectures like Colossus and the network called Jupyter. However, I do know that Google authors their own firmware. When they buy switches, the software is replaced to only allow specific types of traffic. This kind of attention to detail means their network is very fast. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. In this lecture, let's cover some basic interface navigation. Let's take a look at the options now within the query editor. When we execute queries in BigQuery, BigQuery will often provide us with informational messages about the query. In this sample on screen, you can see our queries being executed in the US. Previously, BigQuery executed queries using a non-standard SQL dialect known as BigQuery SQL. With the launch of BigQuery 2.0, BigQuery released support for standard SQL and renamed BigQuery SQL to Legacy SQL. Standard SQL is the preferred SQL dialect for querying data stored in BigQuery. You can set the SQL variant, either Legacy or Standard SQL, by including a prefix in your query in the Web UI, REST API, or using the client library. Take note that the pound sign represents a common in BigQuery. However, the pound sign in front of Standard SQL or Legacy SQL are keywords that set the dialect for your query. Additionally, you can navigate to more than query settings to set the variant you need. There's an easy way to tell if you're in standard SQL or if you're in legacy SQL. So here I am in standard SQL, and we can tell that by the single quotes on the outside. Let's move over to this screen where I have another one to open. And you can see here we are in legacy, and you can tell the legacy by the brackets. All right, so that's the easy way to tell the difference between the two. Not to mention we have a legacy SQL dialect badge here telling us that we are in SQL legacy. All right, let's kill this and let's navigate over to this window. All right, let's talk about this button. This button will save the query for whatever you have in the window. So let's go ahead and save this query. Let's call this query my Q for my query. Is it editable by you? We can drop down or by anyone on the project. 
Let's just say by me for now. And we'll say save. And now that's saved my queue to saved queries. So if you want to save your query for safekeeping, you just save here and it will be under saved queries. And again, we have personal queries and then project queries. Let's go over to personal queries. If I want to open up my queue, I navigate over here and I click on that and it'll open up my queue and it says it's my queue in the window for us to execute. Let's go up to query history again. All right, let's talk about views. Views and BigQuery are the same as they are in relational databases. A view is a virtual table. So let's go ahead and make a view out of this select statement. So let's go ahead and save the view. And it's going to say, do you want it under my first project? Yeah, that's great. And it's going to ask us for a data set. And we don't have a data set. We're going to have to create one. And let's go create a data set. Now, the data set doesn't have to have anything in it. We'll call this empty empty data set. The default location, that's great. And we'll just say, let's create a data set. And now that we've created an empty data set, now we can save our view. All right, so let's come over here and save the view again. Let's click on save view. Now we can save into my first project, empty, and let's call this VW for view, and we'll call it my first view, and we'll say save. And under empty, let's go click under this empty table. You will see we have my first view. Now I said that views are virtual tables, so that means we actually can query this view. So let's go ahead and query this statement that we saved up here to a view called my first view. Let's navigate over here and query the view. And notice it's going to say, hey, you need to put something in here. What fields do you want? Let's make the horrific choice of selecting all of them. Now let's run that. And now you can see we've just queried our view. All right, let's click under more. More has two settings, formatter strings and query settings. And we've seen query settings before when we set the SQL variant. Let's take a look at it again. Let's click on query settings. And over here we have information about our queries. Let's cancel out of that. Now let's navigate to more and look at the other drop down. And it was format. So let's go ahead and format the query based on what BigQuery thinks the format should look like. All right, there it is. That's all that does, that format your query. All right, and that's it to our options within the query editor. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. In this lecture, let's discuss what will be covered in this section. With the explosion in applied machine learning, several careers have either been revamped or created. In this section, you'll learn how three careers, the data scientist, the machine learning engineer, and the data engineer have become several of the most in-demand careers on the planet. This section will also cover applied machine learning. The word applied here means real world. There's a big difference between the real world, research, and academia. This section will cover why this course is focused solely on applied machine learning. There are two core types of machine learning. One is supervised and the other is unsupervised. In this section and in this course, the focus will be on one, supervised machine learning. Almost all real-world machine learning is supervised. Machine learning is very process-oriented. Machine learning engineers and data scientists follow the same core steps every time they're given a project. There's one step in the process you'll be spending a lot of time on. This section will cover that process and focus on why data wrangling is so time-consuming and laborious. The gold standard in applied machine learning is Python. While there are several other languages you can use for your machine learning pursuits, Python has become the most used language in the machine learning space. In this lecture, you'll learn what Python has become the most used language in the applied machine learning space. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on what will be covered throughout this section. In this lecture, let's cover three careers created by the explosion in data science. With the explosion in machine learning and data science, several careers have either been invented or redefined. There's been a lot of role confusion between the core careers in this space. For example, You'll often see those new to the space use the word data analyst synonymous with data scientists. There is a massive difference between the two. Most data analysts aren't that technical. Many roles within an organization use SQL to analyze data. Don't confuse the role of the data analyst with any of these highly technical, sought after roles. Let's start with the most popular role, the data scientist. 
If you ask people the question, what is a data scientist, you'll likely get five different answers. After doing a lot of searching, here's the best canned answer I've come up with. A data scientist uses a blend of various tools, algorithms, and machine learning principles with the goal to discover hidden patterns from their raw data. The data scientist typically comes from academia. They'll often have heavy math and statistics skills and know a lot of the math behind the models. They'll often have advanced degrees in either math or statistics. While they are often really strong theoreticians, they're often weak with working at data or programming. The next role that's been created with the explosion of artificial intelligence is the machine learning engineer. A machine learning engineer is a developer that excels at using data to train models. The models are then used to automate processes like image classification, speech recognition, and market forecasting. This is a great vanilla definition because it includes one key word, developer. Almost all applied machine learning is programming. You source your data with SQL, you'll wrangle and model it with Python, and then you'll put that model onto Pry with any number of front-end languages. All of these tasks require a strong foundation in SQL and Python. Many of the machine learning engineers I work with were DBA, SQL developers, and Python developers. These shortcut roles help them to move into the position because of their extensive experience with data. Don't forget, most applied machine learning is data wrangling. The final role is that of the data engineer. An internal email from Google stated that the top career in the world, from a growth perspective, was that of the data engineer. It's the reason Google created the certified data engineer instead of the certified machine learning engineer. Data engineers are designers, builders, and managers of the information or the data infrastructure. They develop the architecture that helps analyze and process the data in a way the organization needs it, and they make sure these systems are performing smoothly. The data engineer has extensive knowledge of databases and best engineering practices. Regardless of which role you choose, any one of these big three careers will provide you with a great salary, career flexibility, and a real-world abundance of opportunities. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. In this lecture, let's focus on applied machine learning. This crash course will focus on applied machine learning. That means real-world machine learning. You're going to hear this being reiterated throughout the course. There's a big difference between the real world versus academia and research. Additionally, I believe most people taking this course are interested in machine learning as a career, not as a professor or researcher. Earlier in the course, you learned about the artificial intelligence hierarchy. We call that machine learning sits under the AI umbrella. Additionally, data scientists and machine learning engineers use different models for different problems. These models are complicated mathematical algorithms that look for patterns in data. The end goal of these models is to be able to make predictions on fresh data once the model has been properly trained. These models often fall into two wide categories, artificial neural networks and traditional models. While there's been a lot of attention on artificial neural networks, traditional models are used often in the real world. You might be thinking, why would real-world machine learning engineers use traditional models when artificial neural networks are so much better? The truth is that deep learning models aren't better on highly structured data sets than these traditional models are. Almost all real-world machine learning is supervised. That simply means these models are built against existing structured data sets. The structure of the data set that's fed to these models is called an array. An array is almost identical to a table. Currently, most of the models being built in the real world use data from relational databases. While this data does need to be cleaned up a little bit, the shape of this data in these relational databases is that of an array. This is the shape the model understands. A group of traditional models called gradient boosters excel at modeling highly structured data sets. As a matter of fact, this group of models has won almost every competition on highly structured data sets versus deep learning models. Thanks for joining me in this lecture.
In this lecture, let's cover the machine learning process. Machine learning is very process oriented. Machine learning engineers follow the same core steps every time they're given a problem to solve. Before the most basic questions about a problem are defined, the machine learning engineer must look at the data. At this point, a simple question is asked. Is there enough data to solve the problem you're being asked to solve? Models learn from data. All supervised machine learning starts with sourcing data. Since most of applied machine learning is supervised, you'll need a data set before you begin. The next part of the process is arguably the most important, and it's the most time consuming. In the real world, models are built from existing data sets. Data is dirty, and it's the job of the machine learning engineer to massage that data into the cleanest state possible. Most models only accept numerical inputs, and the machine learning engineer must massage that data set into a format the model understands. The process is called data wrangling. This part of the process is what you'll spend most of your time doing. Recent surveys by multiple data science sites show that data wrangling takes up approximately 80% of the time of the machine learning engineer and the data scientist. Once your data set has been wrangled, it's on to modeling. Models are algorithms that look for patterns in your data. The model's goal is to learn from the data set you've cleaned in the previous step. Once the model has been trained, it's ready to be tested again on fresh data. Fresh data is data the model has never seen. The model's end goal is to be able to make highly accurate predictions against fresh data. Once your model has been tuned and tested on fresh data, the final step is to put your model into production. The completed model will be consumed or used by other processes in order to make predictions. For example, Netflix uses a model called a recommendation engine to make predictions on their movie searches. The parameter you pass into this model is the name of the movie. Once you type the movie in the search box, the engine goes to work building a list of recommendations based on your search. That model is in production and it's being consumed by consumers like you and I. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. In this lecture, let's demonstrate how to install Python in your laptop or computer. Python is open source and that means it's free. A company called Continuum Analytics packages Python up via an installer. They call their distribution the Anaconda distribution. This makes Python easy to install. Let's navigate to a browser and type in Python Anaconda. I've previously typed it and Google remembers it, so let's just choose that. You select the first URL, the anaconda.com backslash distribution. Let's navigate to the middle of the page so you can view the supported versions. There's one for Windows, Mac, and Linux. There are two core version forks, a 2x distribution and a 3x distribution. This course will use the 3x distribution. So I'll choose the 3x version, and since my laptop is 64-bit, I'll choose that one. It'll take a few minutes to download, depending on the speed of your pipe. Once the download is completed, hit the Run button. The installer will pane, and from there, you simply click your way through to the install. I'd highly recommend you choose the default path. Once you've chosen all the buttons, hit Install. I'm going to cancel out of the installer because I already have a 3x version installed on my laptop, and I don't want to pollute it with another version. Installing Python is easy. Removing it, sometimes not so easy. That's all there is to installing Python locally on your laptop or computer. Thanks for joining me in this lesson on installing Python. All right, so here we are at our home screen for the Mac. Let's go ahead and open up Safari. Let's go ahead and type in the Anaconda distribution for the Mac. So the Anaconda distribution will work for both Windows and Mac, so we're going to use that because they have an installer. So let's go ahead and type Mac Anaconda Python. So let's go ahead and let Google correct that. And it says the Anaconda distribution. So this looks like it may be our hit. And here it is. Here we are on Mac OS. That's exactly what we want. Down here we have two forks. We have the 3.7 version and we have the 2.7 version. This course is the 3.7 version. We're going to download the graphical installer. Let's go ahead and click on that. All right, the download is completed. Let's go ahead and click on our box. Let's go ahead and open up the installer. Let's click on it. Continue. Here we have our installer. It says Anaconda 3. Let's go ahead and hit continue. Yes, continue. 
we accept any license. Yes, I agree. Installation type. I highly recommend you take the default installation type. Let's go ahead and hit install. It's going to say, hey, what is your password? Right, let's go ahead and type our password. All right, we are preparing for installation. This will take a minute or two. All right, it looks like Microsoft has partnered with Continuum Analytics. Do we want to install the Visual Studio Code? No, not really. Let's go ahead and close. Do I want to move this to trash after it's been installed? I sure do. Go ahead and move it to trash. And now let's go hunt down our shortcut, which should be under Launchpad. Let's open up Launchpad. There it is, the Anaconda Navigator. Let's click on it. Yes, I'd like to improve it. Yep, yeah, sure. All right, let's go ahead and open up a notebook. And in order to do that, we click on Launch Jupyter Notebook. All right, now that the home page for Python is launched, let's go ahead and open up a notebook to begin coding. New Python 3 Notebook. All right, let's go ahead and import Pandas. give it an alias and we'll execute it. And now our Jupyter Notebook is up and running. All right, thanks for joining me in this lecture on how to install Python via the Anaconda distribution on a Mac.
In this lecture, let's cover some basic notebook navigation. Remember, the notebook is our IDE. The first thing we need to do is find it on our laptop. So let's come down here and let's type CMD. And we're going to go to the Anaconda command prompt. It's different than the regular command prompt. Once it loads, we're going to type in Jupyter Notebook. And this will load the Python engine on our local computer. And now you can see this is the home page for our Jupyter Notebook. However, that's a lot of work. Let's go and close that. Let's go ahead and come over here and close that out. Also, the easy way is to come down to our search bar again and type Python. And we will get the Jupyter Notebook desktop app. And we will right click and pin this to taskbar. That way, every time we want to open up our Jupyter Notebook, we click this. Okay, now that we've created our shortcut, let's go ahead and use that to open up our IDE or our Jupyter Notebook. Here we are at the home page, and let's navigate to New Notebook, here Python 3, because that's the version we have installed, to create a new notebook. So let's go ahead and open that. Now, do keep in mind that this is our notebook and it's open, but this doesn't necessarily close it. Let's go ahead and let me show you what I mean. You want to leave? Yeah, I want to leave. Now, if we come over here and we click on running, you can see that that notebook I just created is still running. So we have to come over and shut that down. Let's go to Files, New Notebook again. Let's open up our notebook. And this is our clean Jupyter Notebook. So the first thing we want to do is give it a name. Let's come up here and click on that and give it a name. Let's call this My First Notebook. And we'll hit Rename. And now that'll give us a new name. These are cells. The cells are where we type our code. So let's go ahead and type some code. Let's import pandas. Recall that pandas is a library. So let's type in import pandas as pd. What's this line of code doing? Import means to bring in. Pandas is the name of the library, and as pd is an alias. And the alias is just a shortcut that allows us to type less code. In order to execute that cell, we come up here to this little button that says run, and we hit the run button. And now that it's executed successfully. And you may be thinking, well, how do I know? I didn't get any messages. Yes, when you run code in Python and it runs successfully, there are no messages most of the time. All right, so let's create an error message. Now let's see what happens when we run that. It should say, you've got some invalid syntax, so go ahead and fix that. All right, let's put our alias back, our PD alias. And if we run it, we successfully execute the cell. Now take note that when we successfully execute that cell, another cell is created for us to begin typing out some new code. In our Jupyter Notebook, we have an autosave feature. You can see up here that this was autosaved and checkpointed two minutes ago. However, if you're working on some code and you want to make sure that it's autosaved automatically, you can come up here and click the Save button. So let's go ahead and save it, and it'll say it is auto-saved. All right, let's keep our cell highlighted here and use this next Insert Cell button. So this inserts a cell under wherever you have your cell highlighted. All right, so we've got a new cell. The pair of scissors cuts that selected cell, so let's go ahead and remove that cell. We can see here we've got Copy Selected Cells, so this will copy the cell. You can see it'll paste the selected cells. That's pretty self-explanatory. This will move it up or down. So let's go ahead and move this cell up. Now let's bring it back down. All right. So if we want to execute a cell, we hit Run. Or on a Windows computer, we hit Shift-Enter. That will also execute the cell. Let's bring our cursor back here to highlight the cell. This will stop the execution of the kernel or stop whatever code you are running. This will Restart the kernel with a dialog. Now, let me show you what that means. Restart the kernel basically means restart the Python engine, whatever you use it. So here it'll say, do you really want to restart the kernel? All variables will be lost. That data right there is a variable. So anything stored in that data would be lost. Let's go ahead and continue running. This button here, this last one, looks like a fast forward button. We'll execute all the code on a little cell. So let's see if that works. And I think it'll restart the kernel. All right, let's go ahead and restart the kernel and run all the cells. Go ahead. And there we go. It has executed 
all the cells, and restarted the kernel. All right, that's it for navigation with the toolbar. Here we have code, because we're typing code in our windows. However, we have something called markdown that we can type up that's a lot like HTML. So if I click on the cell, and I come up here and type markdown, I can now annotate my book. Mike's Notebook. And when I hit run, it doesn't give me an error. Obviously, this is text, this isn't code, but now it's an annotation for our notebook. The great thing about this notebook is the simplicity. What we've covered is all we need to know in order to begin working with the machine learning pipeline. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. In this lecture, let's high level what will be covered in this section. Data sets and tables are the foundation of working with data using BigQuery. A data set is a collection of tables. A table is an object that stores your data. As a machine learning engineer, you'll need to be able to create, upload, and wrangle your data in BigQuery. The table is an array you'll use to build your machine learning models with. Fortunately, BigQuery uses a familiar SQL that most data professionals are adept at. The section will also cover wrangling data in BigQuery. Scale is often a major problem when creating real-world models. You'll need lots of data for your models. However, massaging that data and modeling it with on-prem resources is often problematic. If your data is in BigQuery, you can easily wrangle it regardless of size. BigQuery can handle petabytes of data. Google's Cloud Jupyter Notebook is called Cloud Data Lab. It's built on top of a Jupyter Notebook. You can take the notebooks you've worked with on your laptop and upload them to Data Lab. Additionally, modeling your data sets on GCP in the cloud with Data Lab removes the problem of scale. You can wrangle any size data set within BigQuery. Once your data is in the shape you want it, you scale up your Cloud Data Lab instance, and you're ready to build your models at any scale. In this section, BigQuery ML will also be covered. Machine learning on large data sets requires extensive programming knowledge and knowledge of ML frameworks. These requirements restrict the development of models to a very small set of people within each company. To add insult to injury for most organizations, finding data professionals well-versed in machine learning is as difficult as finding data scientists well-versed in data. With BigQuery ML, the only knowledge you'll need programmatically is SQL. While this does have a few drawbacks, it does provide those well-versed in SQL the ability to begin creating machine learning models. It also gives seasoned machine learning professionals the ability to build their models at any scale. The section will also cover GSUtil. While uploading smaller data sets can be accomplished via the web UI, you'll need another approach to upload big data. GSUtil is a command line tool used to manage buckets and objects on Google Storage. It's part of the gCloud shell scripts and can handle most organizations' needs when it comes to transferring data to on-prem to GCP. This section will cover installation and basic navigation using GSUtil. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on what will be covered in this section. In this lecture, let's cover the core machine learning libraries used in applied machine learning. While there are literally hundreds of libraries you can import into Python for machine learning, there are a few you're going to use every day. The foundation for all these libraries is Python. When you need to use any of these libraries, you import the library you need into the environment for use. The single most important library is Pandas. Pandas is a library for data wrangling and data manipulation. You might be thinking, well, why is that number one? Recall that almost all applied machine learning requires you to source and then massage your data into a shape the model understands. Because machine learning engineers spend most of their time wrangling data, this library is the one you'll be working with the most. Pandas provides you with just about everything you need to be able to massage your dirty data into a modelable state. The next library is NumPy. NumPy is the fundamental package for scientific computing with Python. Besides its obvious scientific uses, NumPy can be used as an efficient multidimensional container for generic data. Aha, there it is, the array again. This time it was called a multidimensional container. NumPy supports large, multidimensional arrays and matrices that have been optimized for speed. This makes NumPy arrays ideal for manipulating your data. The next library you'll use quite often as a machine learning engineer is matplotlib. Humans are very visual creatures. We understand things better when we see them visualized. Matplotlib is a Python library used to create 2D graphs and plots used by Python scripts. It supports a wide variety of graphs and plots, namely histograms, bar charts, power spectra, error charts, etc. The final core library is scikit-learn. 
Scikit-learn is a library in Python used to build traditional models. Scikit-learn is a free-to-use machine learning module for Python. It's a straightforward and effective tool for data mining and data analysis. With Scikit-learn, users can conduct a variety of tasks under different categories, like model selection, clustering, pre-processing the data, and more. The library is jam-packed with tools you'll use every day. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. Welcome to this lesson. Let's look at a few of the core machine learning libraries. I've opened a Jupyter Notebook with all the code you'll need to walk through this example. After the notebook's been given a title, it's on to the code. Additionally, the notebook has saved a previous execution of the code. We want to clear that out. To do that, we navigate to Cells, All Output, and then select Clear. This will clear all the output for all the cells in our notebook. The first line of code you've already seen. Pandas is a library for data wrangling and data manipulation. The code in this cell is bringing in that library and creating an alias. Additionally, while it's not obvious here, there's another core library at work. A pandas data frame, the object holding the Titanic dataset, is a NumPy array under the hood. If you're counting, that's two core libraries used in machine learning, pandas and NumPy. OK, let's execute the code with the Run button. However, you can also use the shortcut by hitting the Shift-Enter on a Windows laptop. That's what I'm doing here to execute each cell. In the next line of code, you're creating a variable. A variable is a placeholder in memory for an object. The name of our variable is data. Take note you are using the alias pd here. You're using a function from within the pandas library to load the CSV file into your notebook. The function is called the readCSV function. Python knows where the CSV is located on the file system because the file containing the Titanic dataset has been placed in the root directory of the Python install. This is a famous toy dataset for machine learning. While there was a lot of luck in surviving the Titanic disaster, some groups fared better than others. Spoiler alert, the men didn't do too well. Once the code has been executed, the CSV file is loaded into a variable called data. Let's take a look at that data. What's the shape of our data? Right, it's an array. Why? Because our model only understands arrays. On the next line of code, you're going to return only the lines you're interested in. You're passing in only the columns you want returned from the data variable. Those columns are p-class, sex, age, and survived. The head function will print out the first five rows from our data set. As an aside, in machine learning, columns are called attributes and rows are called observations. Going forward, let's use the correct nomenclature. What do each of these attributes mean? P-class is passenger class. There are three classes on the Titanic, first, second, and third. The next attribute is sex. That's either male or female. The next attribute is age. This is the age of the passenger at the time of the sinking. The last attribute is not part of the original data set. This attribute was added. It's called the target variable. It's the attribute in the data set we are trying to predict. The end goal of this entire process is to be able to predict a person's survivability if they were aboard the Titanic at the time of the sinking. This kind of model is known as a binary classification problem because we're trying to predict a 1 or a 0. A 1 survived and a 0 means did not survive. After you execute the head function, you can see that there is text in an important attribute, the sex column. Computers are monolingual. They only speak numbers. So you need to convert those values to numbers. The next line of code does just that. Using some Python code, we're mapping males to zero and females to one. We call the head function once again to make sure the code is doing what we thought it did. And it did. In the next line of code, you're dropping all the values in the data set that are NANs. The word NAN stands for not a number. This step will remove all the observations that have null or NAN values. Machine learning algorithms are techniques for estimating the target function to predict the output variable y given the input variables x. With that in mind, in the next line of code, you are dropping the attribute name survived from the x-axis. We don't want the model to cheat, so we won't be giving it the answers. In the second line of code, you are telling the model that survived is the target variable. It's that thing you're trying to predict. In the next line of code, you're importing another library. The library you import in is scikit-learn. Scikit-learn is a general purpose library for machine learning. The word sklearn is scikit-learn. Take note you're only importing an object called train test split 
from the container model selection in sklearn. You're not importing the whole library here. The function called train test split separates your data set into two sections. One section will be used for training and one for testing. You can define any split you like, but most of the time you'll see 70% for training and 30% for testing. The data set is separated into two sections to prevent overfitting. Overfitting happens when the model learns the data too well. To prevent overfitting, you only show the model 70% of your data for training and then test it later on the remaining 30%. The next line of code looks a little strange. However, all this code is doing is splitting the data set. There's an X and a Y for training and one for testing. In the next cell, you're importing the model. Take note that in scikit-learn, all models are called classifiers. Again, you are only importing the tree classifier from scikit-learn. The tree classifier is short for decision tree. Once you import the model, you are creating a variable called model to hold the actual model. Recall that the model is an algorithm that will be looking for patterns in your data set. The next line of code is almost identical to the previous one. The only difference is that I'm passing in a parameter to the classifier of the model. The parameter is called min sample split. The parameter simply defines the number of samples required to split an internal node. While that's more technical minutiae than we need to know, the example does show how easy it is to pass parameters into your model. The next line of code calls the fit function on the training data set. Take note you're calling the fit function on the training data set, not the testing data set. Recall that we split the data set earlier. This code is saying, training the model called a decision tree on the training data set. The output you see are the options you have for building your classifier or model. In the final cell, you're calling the predict on the test data. You're saying, now the model's been trained, go ahead and test it on the test data. Recall that this test data is data the model has never seen. Additionally, you are importing some metrics from sklearn or scikit-learn. There are many metrics you can use. However, in this example, you're going to use accuracy. Accuracy is the number of predictions the model made that were correct based on the total number. This model's accuracy was 84% on the testing data set. This was a fantastic score. As a matter of fact, this score puts your model in the top 1% in the famous Titanic Kaggle dataset competition. Kaggle is a website that hosts modeling competitions. Thanks for joining me in this lesson on the core machine learning libraries in Python. In this lecture, let's cover data sourcing and machine learning. In the real world, most models are sourced from relational databases. It's the reason the most required skill for a machine learning engineer is SQL. However, what does that really mean to source your data? Models are fed arrays of data. In this course so far, the data set you've been modeling is a Titanic data set. The nice thing about this data set, and for most others used in the machine learning space, is that it's already been sourced. Someone has already done the hard work from a sourcing point of view. They've gathered the data into a state that's ready to be wrangled. The Titanic data set on screen has all the attributes you need. Additionally, all the observations are filled in. There are no holes in the data. Recall that observations are rows in machine learning speak. The target variable has also been added. It's also in a CSV document, so it can easily be shared. All right, so now you know what we want. How do we get there in the real world? Let's move over to an interface for managing SQL Server databases. This interface is called SQL Server Management Studio. It's the interface SQL Server DBAs and SQL Server developers use to work with their data. On this server, there's an instance of SQL Server with a database called ACloud. You've been given the task of creating a data set that can be used to predict future sales. All right, well, where do you start? Your application has a table called Logins. This table houses all your clients. Your company sells products to the stars and you've managed to sign up three well-known stars. The login table only houses usernames and passwords. Now, in our highly contrived example, the passwords are in plain text. In the real world, they'd be encrypted. The table does provide us with customer names, but that doesn't give us much. Fortunately, there's another table in the database that houses orders for the stars. You craft a query to join these two tables. Now we are getting somewhere. We now have an order history of items purchased by these celebrities. This is good, but we aren't done yet. There's a table in the database that houses personal information about our customers. When we join on all three tables, we have the personal history and their purchase history. Now we are getting some really good information for modeling. 
age, sex, income, and education are all good attributes from a machine learning perspective. Next, you'll need to save the query so you can use it whenever you need it. In order to do that, you create a view called Cust Order Hist. A view is a virtual table that you can query. Now that our view has been created, let's go ahead and export the contents of that view to a CSV file so we can share it with the rest of the team. We can do that quite easily in SQL Server. Let's come over here to our A Cloud database. We're going to right click, we're going to go to Tasks, and we're going to export some data. So let's go ahead and hit the Export Data button. Let's pull this to the middle. Let's hit Next. We're going to have to create a connection for SQL Server because we're trying to connect to this database instance that has our A Cloud database on it. So to do that, we come here. Let's navigate down to OLEDB Provider for SQL Server. This is the instance we want to connect to. Here is our database. Let's come down here and hit Next. Now we need to choose a flat file destination. Recall we're going to export this to a flat file or a CSV file. So we need to choose a flat file destination. Here is a good one. All right, let's browse to a location where we want to save that CSV file to. Let's save it to desktop for now, and we'll call this test.csv. We'll hit open. Let's hit next. In SQL Server, you can copy from tables or views. We're going to use the view we've already created. So let's go ahead and hit next. You can see it's defaulted us to the login table. However, we want the view. So let's go ahead and hunt that view down. Here it is. That's the view we created. Let's go ahead and take a look at the data. So let's go ahead and hit preview. That's indeed the data we want to output to share with our team. Let's say OK. Let's come down here and say next. And let's say finish and finish again. And now we successfully copy that data from our view, from our iCloud database, to a CSV file. And when we navigate to the desktop, you can see our CSV file has indeed been created. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on sourcing data. In this lecture, let's cover exploratory data analysis. In machine learning, you'll often hear data analysis referred to as exploratory data analysis. It's the same thing as data analysis is. You might be thinking, in the lecture on core machine learning libraries, you missed one. Ah, you are correct. I didn't cover Matplotlib, did I? Data visualization gets its own demo. Matplotlib is a library used for data analysis. It's used to help you visualize your data. In this lecture, you'll also see another library for data exploration. That library is called Seaborn. It's built on top of Matplotlib, and it's often the preferred library due to its simplicity. All right, let's take a look at some code. In the first cell, you're importing pandas. In the next cell, you're importing your data set. Once again, you'll be analyzing the Titanic data set. You're storing your data set in a variable called data. You use that variable throughout this lesson. In the next cell, you call the head function to view your data. Take note that this time you've passed in a number into the head function. The 10 tells the head function to return the first 10 observations or rows in the data set. Next, Let's use some simple Python to get started. This line of code is straightforward. You're asking Python to give you a sum of all the values that are nulls or nands. Age has 177 missing values and cabin has 687. Fortunately, cabin isn't an important attribute and it's not needed for building your model. In the next line, you're returning the sum of all the null values for just one column or one attribute, the age column. You've already done this above. I just wanted to show you how to do it on a single attribute. In the next line of code, you are calculating the percentage of missing values specific to age compared to the entire data set. You conclude that 20% of all passengers in the data set are missing the age attribute. Since the age attribute is critical to the data set, you'll need to figure out what to do to handle this problem. You eventually decide that 20% of the data set is a tolerable loss because you have enough data to model after you remove that 20%. Additionally, this makes the results more true because you don't have to fabricate any of those values. Next, it's on to visualization with matplotlib. Before you use any library in Python, you're going to need to import it. Let's import plyplot from matplotlib and alias it as plot, plt. Next, let's create a variable ax and craft a histogram based on the age attribute. You set the axis for both. The x-axis will be age and the y will be count. Lastly, you call the show function. This simply tells matplotlib 
to render the graph and print the results out to us. Our graph is right skewed. That means there are fewer values on the right hand side than there are on the left hand side. It's actually surprising that there were that many children aboard. In the next cell, the Seaborn library is being imported. Recall that this library sits on top of matplotlib. In this example, you've imported Seaborn and aliased it as SNS. In the next line of code, you are creating a bar plot by simply passing the x and y axes on your dataset variable called data. I really like the simplicity of Seaborn. I told you males didn't fare so well. The survival rate for females is much greater than it is for males. During this time period, it looks like chivalry was still alive. In the next line of code, you're crafting another bar chart. This time, you want to know the survival rate of the passengers by class. Look at how simple this code is. As you might have guessed, those in third class didn't do as well as those in first. In the next cell, let's create a grouping by using the group by function on our data. The code groups gender based on the price they paid for a ticket. In the next line of code, let's use the grouping we created above to visualize the amount of money each gender paid based on the class they were in. You can see that females paid much more for their tickets than males in every single class. Talk about gender discrimination. That's okay, they got the last laugh. In the final example, let's create a bar chart that shows where the passenger boarded the ship from. The S is Southampton, the C is for Cherbourg, and the Q is for Queenstown. Most of the passengers boarded in Southampton. You can see just how easy it is to create incredible visualizations with these two libraries. Thanks for joining me in this lesson on exploring data in Python. Recall that machine learning is divided into two broad categories, deep learning models and traditional models. Part of applied machine learning is knowing what approach to use in order to solve a problem you're given. If deep learning models excelled at everything, then that's all we'd use everywhere. However, right now that's not the case. Deep learning models excel at image recognition and speech recognition. However, most applied machine learning is supervised. That means the models are built against highly structured data sets. Most of supervised machine learning fits into two categories, classification and regression problems. A class of traditional models known as gradient boosters are more accurate, less computationally intensive, easier to explain, and excel at classification and regression problems. All right, let's move over to a Jupyter notebook and build a traditional model using Python. In the first cell, let's import some libraries. The first thing you want to import is pandas. You'll use that for data wrangling. Next, you import train test split from scikit-learn. You want to split your data into a training set and a testing set to avoid overfitting. The final library you'll import here is XGBoost. This is the most famous gradient booster. It's the most famous because it's won almost every competitive modeling competition on structured data sets. Additionally, its integration into scikit-learn makes it easy for machine learning engineers to incorporate into the real-world projects. In the next cell, let's read our data set into a variable using the read CSV function. Next, you'll load only the attributes you need. These are the attributes you decided to use based on your analysis of the data. Next, let's call the head function to make sure your data set looks as you expect it to. You'll use head function often to ensure the code you executed has given you the results you need. Next, let's map the sex attributes, zeros for males and ones for females. You call the head function once again. All right, it looks good so far. Let's clean up all the NANs in the data set using drop in A. Just as an aside here, when you call drop in A on the entire data set, it removes all the NAND values from every attribute. In the next cell, you're dropping the target variable, survived, from the x axis and mapping the y variable to survived, the target variable again. This tells the model target variable is survived. In the next cell, let's cover the data into training and testing sets. You want to prevent the model from cheating. The next cell loads the XGBoost classifier and calls the fit function on Xtrain and Ytrain. Take note it's calling the fit function on the training data set, not the testing data set yet. In the next cell, you are running the model against the testing data set, not the training data set this time. In the last cell, you're importing the metrics you want to use, in this case, accuracy, and you're returning the results of your model. In this run, you've achieved a score of 83%. That's a very good score in this data set. Let's save the model so it can be called later. In order to do that, you use another library called Pickle. Pickle is a library in Python 
that serializes objects so they can be saved to a file and loaded into a program again later. Recall the strength of the Python language is a plethora of libraries you have access to that are specific to machine learning. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on building a binary classifier using XGBoost. In this lecture, let's discuss what will be covered in this section. In this section, the two core types of supervised machine learning used in the applied machine learning space will be discussed. Linear regression is one of the most fundamental and widely used machine learning algorithms. Linear regression models the relationship between a dependent variable y and one or more independent variables x using a best fit straight line, known as a regression line. Like regression, classification is a supervised learning technique. Supervised learning means predicting input values based on the label or the target variable of the training examples that you have previously provided. Classification separates observations into groups based on their characteristics. For example, students applying to medical schools could be likely separated into accepted, maybe accepted, and unlikely to be accepted based on grades, MCAT scores, medical experience, and other outstanding activities. One of the most popular types of classification problems is binary classification. Binary classification involves classifying the data into two groups. For example, whether a customer buys a product or not based on independent values such as gender, age, or location. The output of the model is either a yes or a no, A or a B, etc. This section will also define artificial neural networks. The term neural network refers to, as the name suggests, a biologically inspired subfield of artificial intelligence modeled loosely after the brain. In this section, we'll also define what separates deep learning models from artificial neural networks. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on what will be covered throughout this section. In this lecture, let's discuss linear regression, one of the most common types of problems in applied machine learning. Linear regression is a supervised learning problem. That means it works with existing data. Let's craft a definition of linear regression in the simplest way possible. Linear regression is predicting a value, or values, based on a line. All right, let's get a little more technical. It's a kind of statistical analysis that attempts to show a relationship between two variables. Linear regression looks at various data points and plots a trend line. The model uses the existing data points to predict other data points on that line. Linear regression is often used in forecasting and can predict apparently random data points showing trend lines of data, such as cancer diagnoses or stock prices. Let's work through an example. You in an ice cream shop, you want to predict how much you're going to sell in the next month. To do this, you use many daily temperatures as your parameter to measure how many sales you'll make on a given day. You have a total of two variables, sales and temperature. Your sales variable is the output variable and your temperature is the independent variable. That means the amount of sales you would make is dependent on the temperature of the day. Next, you need some data. You collect the past few months of data based on the sales with respect to the temperature on those days. Based on the data collected, the next step is to plot a graph between sales and the temperature values. After plotting the data, you need to draw a regression line that would fit all the data points as closely as possible. That line will be your prediction line. It's time to make a prediction based on your data. Let's pick a temperature value at random and plot it on the chart. The model plots that value based on the line. Now the model checks the other axes and can easily find the sales for that data point. That's how linear regression works. Thanks for joining me in this lesson on defining linear regression. In this lecture, let's work through a demonstration on linear regression. In this example, you'll predict the percentage of grades that a student is expected to score based upon the number of hours he or she studied. Let's jump over to Python in order to get started. In the first cell, let's import the libraries you'll need for this lecture. The first one is called Pandas for massaging our data. The second one is NumPy for holding our data in an optimized array container. And the last one is matplotlib, the data visualization library. The line of code that reads percentage matplotlib inline tells the Jupyter Notebook to print out the graph when plot show is called. Next, you'll create a variable called dataset to hold your data. Next, let's use shape to print out the number of columns and rows in our dataset. Actually, I should say the number of observations and the number of attributes. This dataset has two attributes and 25 observations. Let's call the head function to view the data. The two attributes in the data set are hours and scores. In the next cell, let's visualize the data. You are creating a graph using the first line of code and defining the properties of that graph in the next few lines. Lastly, 
the show function is being called to view the results. This graph makes it easy to see that there's a positive linear relationship between the hours studied and the scores you achieve. In the next cell, you're telling the model what data to use for training and testing and what the target variable is going to be. The data, except for the target variable, is stored in the X variable. This variable holds the hours. The Y variable is the target variable. In this case, the target variable is the score. Let's print out the X variable, the variable that holds the hours, so you can see that those values are indeed the hours studied. In the next cell, we carve up the data in two training and testing sets in order to prevent overfitting. In the next cell, let's import the classifier model used for linear regression in scikit-learn. Once it's imported, you create a variable to hold the model, then fit the model to the training data. In the next cell, let's see how well the model did. A variable called ypred is created to hold the prediction made against the test data. In the next cell, let's print out the actual values versus the predicted values. Though our model isn't very precise, the predicted percentages are close to the actual ones. Thanks for joining me in this demonstration on creating a linear regression model in Python. In this brief lecture, let's define classification at a high level. Like linear regression, classification is a supervised machine learning technique, and that means you'll need data in order to solve the problem. Classification problems are probably the most common type of project in all of applied machine learning. Let's start with a simplified definition of classification. Classification separates observations into groups based on their characteristics. The canonical example in machine learning is spam. For spam detection software, any email can be divided into two categories. The email is either spam or it's not. Therefore, you can place any email into two distinct groups, one for spam and one for not spam. And of course, you've been working with the classification problem. The Titanic machine learning project is a classification problem. The items being separated into distinct groups in our problem are people. One bucket is for passengers who have survived, and the other bucket is for passengers who have died. This type of classification problem is a binary classification problem. It's a binary classification problem because the output of the model is either a 1 for survived or a 0 for didn't survive. Recall that computers are monolingual, and we have to pass our model's numbers for them to work. Thanks for joining me in this short lesson on defining classification. In this lecture, let's build a classification model with a high degree of accuracy. In the first cell, you're going to import the libraries you need for building your model end to end. Take note that most of the time, machine learning engineers and data scientists import their libraries in the first cell. This isn't required, just something you'll see often. As an aside, I've added comments throughout the notebook. Recall that the pound sign in front of any text in our notebooks is used for annotations. In the first cell, you're going to import the entire Pandas library and alias it as PD. Next, you're importing the specific modules from Scikit-Learn you'll use throughout the lecture. Recall that the name of the library for Scikit-Learn is SKLearn. Throughout most of the course, you've been working with the Titanic dataset. Let's use another dataset that's well known within the machine learning space. This is the IRIS dataset. The IRIS dataset contains four features, length and width of sepals and petals, of 50 samples of three species of irises, the iris setosa, the iris virginica, and the iris versicolor. These measurements were used to create a linear discriminant model to classify the species. The data set is often used in data mining, classification, and clustering examples, and to test algorithms. Notice how the data is being imported. Python allows you to import the data directly from a URL. In this cell, you're creating a variable called dataset and importing the iris dataset into that variable. Additionally, you're creating a second variable, data, that houses all the attributes in the dataset. Next, let's go ahead and issue the head function in order to view the data. Ah, look at all those numbers. Music to my eyes. There's only one attribute there that isn't numerical, and that's the fifth attribute, the target variable. In the next cell, let's create two variables. The x variable will house all the attributes, and the y variable will house the target variable. Let's print out the y variable so you can view the contents of it. What do you see? Yep, lots of text. Your model doesn't speak English, so you need to convert those names to numbers. One way to do that is called label encoding. Label encoding is simply encoding the textual values to numbers. In order to do label encoding here, you craft a variable called label encoder underscore y and set it to the label encoder class in scikit-learn. You then call the fit transform on that variable. All right, now that it's been executed, let's go ahead and print out y after the encoding has been completed. Nice, the labels are all now numerical and it's on to modeling. 
In the next cell, you're going to separate your data into two groups. One is for training and one is for testing. You're passing in two parameters. The first one is test size, which determines how the data is to be split, and the second parameter is random state. This is simply done for reproducibility of the model. The 0.3 in the test size means that 70% of your data will be used for training and 30% will be used for testing. Next, let's import a model. In this example, you're going to be using a random forest classifier. Random forest models build multiple decision trees and merge them together to create a more accurate and stable prediction. After you create a variable classifier to hold your model, you call the fit method to train your model on the data. In the last cell, you're testing the completed model against your training data. Wow, your model is 97% accurate. That means the model can predict the kind of iris you have based on the measurements discussed above 97% of the time. That's a highly accurate model. Congratulations, you've just built a highly accurate classification model using Scikit-Learn. Thanks for joining me in this lecture. In this lecture, let's high level what will be covered in this section. Datasets and tables are the foundation of working with data using BigQuery. A dataset is a collection of tables. A table is an object that stores your data. As a machine learning engineer, you'll need to be able to create, upload, and wrangle your data in BigQuery. The table is an array you'll use to build your machine learning models with. Fortunately, BigQuery uses a familiar SQL that most data professionals are adept at. The section will also cover wrangling data in BigQuery. Scale is often a major problem when creating real-world models. You'll need lots of data for your models. However, massaging that data and modeling it with on-prem resources is often problematic. If your data is in BigQuery, you can easily wrangle it regardless of size. BigQuery can handle petabytes of data. Google's Cloud Jupyter Notebook is called Cloud Data Lab. It's built on top of a Jupyter Notebook. You can take the notebooks you've worked with on your laptop and upload them to Data Lab. Additionally, modeling your data sets on GCP in the cloud with Data Lab removes the problem of scale. You can wrangle any size data set within BigQuery. Once your data is in the shape you want it, you scale up your Cloud Data Lab instance, and you're ready to build your models at any scale. In this section, BigQuery ML will also be covered. Machine learning on large data sets requires extensive programming knowledge and knowledge of ML frameworks. These requirements restrict the development of models to a very small set of people within each company. To add insult to injury for most organizations, finding data professionals well-versed in machine learning is as difficult as finding data scientists well-versed in data. With BigQuery ML, the only knowledge you'll need programmatically is SQL. While this does have a few drawbacks, it does provide those well-versed in SQL the ability to begin creating machine learning models. It also gives seasoned machine learning professionals the ability to build their models at any scale. The section will also cover GSUtil. While uploading smaller data sets can be accomplished via the web UI, you'll need another approach to upload big data. GSUtil is a command line tool used to manage buckets and objects on Google Storage. It's part of the G Cloud Shell scripts and can handle most organizations' needs when it comes to transferring data to on-prem to GCP. This section will cover installation and basic navigation using GSUtil. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on what will be covered in this section. In this lecture, let's discover what will be covered in this section. There are literally hundreds of libraries you can import into Python to extend the functionality of the core language. However, there are a handful you'll use every day in the applied machine learning space. This section will cover those libraries. One of the most used libraries is Pandas. Much of machine learning is data related, and the gold standard for data massage in Python is Pandas. We humans are visual learners, well, most of us. In order to understand your data at a granular level, you'll need to create visualizations that assist you in making modeling decisions. This section will cover exploratory data analysis in Python. You've learned that sourcing data is critical to the machine learning process, but what exactly does that mean? In this section, sourcing data from a relational database will be covered. You'll use a relational database called SQL Server to create a view from your underlying data set and then export that data to a CSV file, the most used data source in machine learning. Data wrangling will be covered in this section. Data wrangling is massaging your data into a clean, numerical state the model can understand. Machine learning models are monolingual. They only want numerical data. Data wrangling is often the most time-consuming part of the job for most applied machine learning engineers. Lastly, you'll build a traditional model using the data set you wrangled. The term traditional models are simply used for models that live outside deep learning models. Many traditional models, for example, 
a group of models called gradient boosters, outperform their deep learning counterparts on highly structured data sets. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on what will be covered throughout this section. In this lecture, let's cover some of the nuances of data sets and tables. Starting out at GCP's homepage, let's navigate to BigQuery and create a data set. Data sets allow you to organize and control access to your tables. When you craft a data set, you specify two options. The data set ID is the name of your data set and the location of where your data will be stored. You need to specify location for data compliance issues if any exist. Once the data set is created, you can add tables to it. When loading data, querying data, or exporting data, BigQuery determines the location to run the job based on the data sets referenced in the request. For example, if your query references a table stored in a data set located in Asia Northeast 1, the query job will run in that region. When you create tables in BigQuery, you're presented with several source options. A source is the location where your data resides. The first one is to create an empty table. That one's pretty self-explanatory. In BigQuery, you can create a data source called an external data source. The three options for accessing external data are Cloud Bigtable, Cloud Storage, and Google Drive. An external data source, also known as a federated data source, is a data source you can query directly even though the data isn't stored in BigQuery. Instead of loading and streaming the data, you create tables that reference the external data source. Now, why would you want to do this? You have a small amount of frequently changing data you'd like to join with other tables. As an external data source, the frequently changing data doesn't need to be reloaded every time it's updated. Now, it's nice to have options, but for most of our use cases as machine learning engineers, your data needs to reside in BigQuery. The next one is upload. This is the one we'll use the most often. To upload data from a readable data source, such as your local machine, you can use the GCP console, the BigQuery UI, the CLI, or the API. And you can also use client libraries. Once you choose a location where your file is stored, you're presented with several option types that you can upload. The first one is CSV files. These are comma separated value documents. CSV files are used often in machine learning. Next is JSON. The third option is Arvo. Arvo is an open source data format that bundles serialized data with the data schema in the same file. Loading Arvo related data has some advantages over other types of files like CSVs. It's faster to load. The data can be read in parallel, even if the data blocks are compressed. Arvo doesn't require typing or serialization. Additionally, it's easier to parse data because there's no encoding issues found in other formats such as ASCII files. With that in mind, most machine learning engineers and data scientists will use CSV files because that's what they're comfortable with. The next option is Parquet. Parquet is an open source column-oriented data format that's widely used in the Apache Hadoop ecosystem. Lastly, there's ORC. Again, ORC is an open source column-oriented data format that's widely used in the Apache Hadoop ecosystem. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on exploring data sets and tables. In this lecture, let's cover the Google's Cloud Data Lab. A data lab is a VM that's hosted on GCP that contains a notebook almost identical to a Jupyter Notebook. Actually, the data lab interface was built on top of a Jupyter Notebook. That means you'll be able to take your code from your Jupyter Notebooks locally and use them on GCP. A VM or a virtual machine is also called an instance. It's an on-demand server that you activate as needed. The underlying hardware is shared among other users in a transparent way and as such becomes entirely virtual to you. You only choose a global geographic location of an instance that's hosted in one of Google's data centers. When you launch a new instance, GCE starts by attaching persistent disk to your VM. This provides you with the disk space and gives you the instance root file system required to boot up. The disk installs the OS associated with the image you have chosen. A VM is defined by a type of persistent disk and an operating system, such as Windows and Linux. The persistent disk is your virtual slice of hardware. All right, let's move over to GCP and spin up a data lab instance. In order to get started, click on the Cloud Shell in the upper right-hand corner. Google's Cloud Shell is a standalone terminal in your browser from which you can access and manage your resources. The lower part of your browser becomes the Shell Terminal. This terminal runs an F1 Micro Google Compute Engine virtual machine with a Debian operating system and 5 gigs of storage. It's created on a per-user, per-session basis. It persists while your Cloud Shell is active 
and is deleted after 20 minutes of inactivity. Since the disk is persistent across sessions, your content, files, and configurations will be available from session to session. Every Cloud Shell instance is pre-installed with gCloud SDK and VIM. To create a new data lab, simply type out Data Lab Create and the name of your instance. The instance in this lecture will be a Cloud 2. After you've given your instance a name, you'll need to choose a storage region. Most data regions have data labs, however, you'll need to check to ensure yours does or choose a region that has one. I'm on the East Coast, so I'll choose an East Coast region and hit Enter. You'll likely be prompted to create an SSH key. Don't type anything in here for this exercise. Simply hit the Enter key twice. The ACloud2 instance is being created. This may take some time. For example, in this scenario, it took seven minutes to spin up this instance. Once that's completed, click on the Web Preview button on the terminal window and choose Change Port. In the Change Port dialog box, type in 8081 and hit Change and Preview. Your Data Lab notebook is now open and ready for business. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on creating the Data Lab instance on the Google Cloud Platform. In this lecture, let's use our BigQuery Wrangled dataset inside a Cloud Data Lab instance to model the Titanic dataset. The first thing you need to do is activate your Cloud Shell by clicking on the icon in the upper right hand corner. In order to connect to the A Cloud 2 Data Lab VM, type Data Lab Connect A Cloud 2. That's the command used to connect to an existing Data Lab notebook. Once the connection is complete, click on Web Preview in the terminal window and change the port to 8081 and then hit Change in Preview. There's an existing Data Lab notebook that's been created for this lecture. You can create a new notebook by clicking on the New Notebook button in the upper left hand side of our screen. This creates a notebook where you can begin authoring your code. In the first cell, Pandas is being imported and the cell is being executed. All right, let's close this notebook and delete it. A previous notebook has been created for this lecture, so let's work with it. Once the new notebook is open, it's time to get coding. The first two cells are the key pieces of code for working with our data in BigQuery. The first thing you need to do is import BigQuery and alias it as BQ. This step is identical to importing other libraries. In the next cell, you're creating a connection to BigQuery. You start by creating a variable query with three double quotes that enclose the entirety of your SQL code. Take note, you're only returning 1,000 rows from the view you created earlier in the course. This view houses the wrangled Titanic dataset that was done in BigQuery. In the second part of the cell, you create a variable called df and write out the contents of the query you defined above to a pandas data frame. Keep in mind, this is all Google's code. This is their programmatic approach to working with data housed in BigQuery. Lastly, within the cell, you call the head function to view your data. The rest of the code was imported from a previous notebook you completed on modeling the Titanic dataset using a Jupyter Notebook earlier in this course. Drop in A is called on the dataset. X and Y are defined and the target variable is dropped on the X axis. You import train test split in order to segment your data. Take note that all these libraries are prepackaged on GCP also. We don't have to do anything but to call them. In the next cell, you import the decision tree classifier. Next, you're going to redefine your model and pass in min sample split to your classifier. You fit the model to your training data. In the final cell, you import your metrics and score your model. As an aside, you can alter your query directly inside the cell and then simply execute that cell. A new pandas data frame is created that houses the data set from the query you just altered. In the example on screen, you're reducing the amount of columns returned in the data set and re-executing the cell. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on importing your data from BigQuery to your Google Cloud Data Lab notebook. In this lecture, you're going to model the Iris dataset you uploaded and wrangled to GCP. So here we are at the Google Home page. Let's go ahead and navigate to our menu. Let's go ahead to BigQuery. Let's take a gander at our Iris dataset. Here is the Iris dataset. Let's go ahead and query the Iris dataset. We will select all. We will run. All right, everything looks good. That data set is model ready. So the next thing we need to do is connect to our data lab. So let's go ahead and open up our Cloud Shell. 
Let's go ahead and connect to our data lab. Data lab connect. The name of the data lab is acloud2. This will take a few seconds. All right, so now the data lab notebook is up. Let's come up here to web preview. Go to web preview. Come down here to change port. Let's change this to 81. And let's change and preview. All right, so here is our Jupyter Notebook. Instead of creating a new Jupyter Notebook, we've already done this locally on our laptop. So let's go ahead and just upload that notebook to this location. So let's go ahead and hit upload. Let's navigate and find that notebook. It was called mm, Classification Demo Iris, I believe. Click on it. Click Upload. And now that Jupyter Notebook is uploaded into our data lab, let's go ahead and click on it. All right, so the only thing we need to alter is how we import the data. We're not going to import the data from a URL like we've done here. So let's go ahead and delete this. Let's add some code. So let's click above this. Let's go ahead and add code. Let's move back to our other notebook because we've already done this. So let's click on this notebook. Control copy. Control V. We're going to import the BigQuery library so we can use BigQuery. Let's move back over here. We need this. Control copy. And let's click on here. All right, we're on the right cell. Let's add some more code. Now we're going to control V. All right, so we want the iris data set. So let's go ahead and just copy this. We'll highlight it and hit just control C. That'll copy it. And inside here, inside our quotes, right, our triple double quotes, control V. We don't have to limit it. We're going to change our variable here. Instead of DF, right, down here we have data. So we don't have to change anything in the notebook that we uploaded. We're going to just change the data variable. So that's all we have to change. All right, let's go ahead and close that gap. And let's start at the beginning. Let's import our libraries. Let's run that code. All right, great. We've got a deprecated warning for some code. We can ignore that. Let's go ahead and run the next cell. And the next cell is where the magic happens. We're going to import the Iris data set from BigQuery. All right, so we've imported the Iris data set, and it's in a pandas data frame. That looks great. Now, moving forward, we don't need this, do we? Because we've already called the head function up here. So let's go ahead and delete that. And now I think everything should be the same. Let's go ahead and execute that cell. Name data set is not found. Data set, data, data set, data. How about just data? No, let's go back. Quit trying to help me type. Data. Let's go ahead and run it again. Let's navigate to this cell. Let's go ahead and print out Y to make sure our target variable is indeed numeric. All right, it is. We don't have to encode our labels because it's already done, so we can remove this cell. So I'll just click on the cell and come up and delete it. In this cell, we're going to split the data into training and testing sets. Let's go ahead and run that code. All right, we're going to create our classifier. In this one, we're going to use a random forest classifier. We're going to train the classifier on our data. Let's go ahead and execute that. And lastly, let's go ahead and output the prediction for our model. So let's click on that last cell. And that's all there is to modeling a data set we've uploaded to GCP. Thanks for joining me in this lecture in modeling the IRIS data set and uploading a notebook locally to be used on GCP.
In this lecture, you're going to upgrade your Data Lab instance. More resources in the cloud is often only a few clicks away. All right, so here we are at the Google Home page. And under our resources, we have one compute engine. And that compute engine is our Cloud Data Lab. So that makes it easy to find. Let's go ahead and click on that compute engine on our Cloud Data Lab. It's shut down. If it were not shut down, you would have to come over here to the ellipses, click on that, and then stop. Since it is shut down, all we have to do is click on the name of the instance. Let's go ahead and click on that. All right, in order to add more resources to this box, simply come up here to edit. It'll give us the properties of this instance. And now we're going to upgrade this to a whopping two virtual CPUs. We'll come down to the bottom. We'll hit save. You can see we're updating our instance. This will take a little while. Let's navigate back. All right, that's all there is to upgrading your instance. How simple was that to add more resources to your Cloud Data Lab in case you need it for building your models? Now, we could start it this way if we wanted to. Come here and we could click Start. We could also go to Activate our Cloud Shell and connect to our Data Lab, and it would start it this way. This is what we're used to. So let's go ahead and Data Lab connect a cloud to, and this will also start up the data lab. Starting our instance. And now our instance has started. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on resizing your data lab notebook. In this lecture, let's define BigQuery ML and how it can be used to build models at scale inside the comfort of the SQL language. BigQuery ML democratizes machine learning by enabling SQL practitioners to build models using existing SQL tools and skills. BigQuery ML increases development speed by eliminating the need to move data. There are currently three types of models supported in BigQuery ML. The first one is linear regression. These models can be used for predicting a numerical value. The second is binary logistic regression. These models can be used for predicting one or two classes, such as identifying whether email is a spam. Thirdly, there's multi-class logistic regression for classification. These models can be used to predict more than two classes, such as whether an input is low value, medium value, or high value. Machine learning on large data sets requires extensive programming and knowledge of ML frameworks. These requirements help restrict solution development to a very small set of people within the organization and they exclude data analysts who understand data but have a limited machine learning knowledge and programming expertise. BigQuery ML reduces the machine learning learning curve by allowing those familiar with SQL the ability to wrangle their own data and build their own models all within the confines of SQL. Analysts can use BigQuery ML to build and evaluate models in BigQuery. Developers and DBAs can use their SQL skills to build and test machine learning models. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on defining BigQuery ML. In this lecture, we're going to use BigQuery ML to create a binary logistic regression model. Let's create a model using the Titanic view created earlier in the course. Recall this view has the wrangled data set ready for modeling. Creating an end-to-end -end model in BigQuery requires three core steps. The first step is defining or creating the model. Let's navigate to BigQuery and dive into the code. The first thing to notice is that the creation of the model is all SQL. No other code required. If you're familiar with SQL, then the learning curve for creating this model in BigQuery will be short. The first line of code creates the model. The model called Titanic Model is being created within the confines of the Titanic project. Don't forget that everything in GCP lives under the aegis of the project. In the next line of code, you specify your options. You're passing two parameters into this model. The first one is model type. This model is going to be a logistic regression model. The second parameter is input label calls. This will be the target variable. Once you define the target variable, BigQuery knows you want to use the other columns or attributes to train your model with. After the as keyword, you execute a select statement based on the view that's already been crafted. This is a definition phase of creating the model in BigQuery ML. After the model has been executed successfully, 
the name of your new model will show up under your project. The second step is model evaluation. In order to evaluate the model, you issue a select statement using the code ml.evaluate and the name of your model you want to evaluate. In our example, the name of the model is Titanic underscore model. It's the model you just crafted in the first step. Once the model has been completed, the evaluation phase is over and several key metrics will be presented as the output. The key metric for us is accuracy. The model has an accuracy of around 77%. The third step in the process is prediction. In this step, you pass the model fresh data. Fresh data is data the model has never seen before. In this example, a CSV was created using my family as input. The first column shows that my family was in second class. The sex of each family member is defined. I'm married with two children. The age of each family member is also specified. Additionally, SIB, SP, and PARCH are added. Once the CSV file is uploaded to BigQuery, it's ready to be passed to the model. Take note the code is almost identical to evaluation. You're calling ML predict on the model and passing the model the table you've just uploaded. The model is being passed all the columns except survived, the target variable. Once the evaluation phase is completed, the model will make a prediction for me and each of my family members. The first of the three columns in the output is predicted survived. The one is for survived and the zero is for did not survive. The next two columns, predicted survived probs.label, and predicted survive probs.prob output the chances of survival for each passenger. The first prediction the model makes is for me. The model predicts that I didn't make it and that my chance of surviving the sinking was around 24%. The model predicts that my wife also didn't make it. Her chance of survival isn't much better at 28%. My youngest had the best chance of surviving the sinking at around 66%. The model predicted that both of my children would have survived the sinking. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on building a binary classification model using BigQuery ML. In this lecture, let's install the command line tool called gsutil. Google Storage is a file storage service available from the Google Cloud. It's similar to Amazon's S3, and it offers in-depth functionality such as signed URLs, bucket synchronization, collaboration bucket settings, parallel uploads, and it's S3 compatible. gsutil, a command line tool written in Python, is part of the gcloud command line interface. To use gsutil, you install the Google Cloud SDK, which is a set of tools for working inside Google's cloud. Let's go ahead and do that now. All right, let's navigate to a browser. And let's go ahead and type in Google Cloud SDK. I've typed it already, so let's go ahead and click on that. All right, let's go ahead and click on Cloud SDK. We want to install it for Windows because this is a Windows laptop. It takes us to this quick start but we don't want the quick start. We actually want the installer. So let's go ahead and click download the Google Cloud SDK installer. Uh, let's go ahead and save it. And let's go ahead and run it from the save position. Let's click on the installer and help Cloud SDK better. Yeah, sure, why not? I agree. How about all users? Let's go next. Yep. That looks like a great location. Next. All right, we're gonna install everything but those beta commands, install. This will obviously take a few minutes. All right, it's been successfully installed. We wanna run cloud init to configure SDK. So that last one is a yes. Go ahead and click finish. Okay, it prompts us to log into GCP. It says, would you like to log in? Yes, I would. Which account would you like to use to log in? This one. Yes, I want to allow. All right, so it's not allowing us to sign in. Oftentimes, this is a problem with your firewall. I'm going to stop the install here, and then I'm going to have a look at the firewall rules. And once I figure it out, we're going to try again. All right, once I turned off the Windows firewall, I was able to get past the initial failure. And to do that, I came back into Cloud SDK. I'm going to show you how I did that. I came down to my search box. And I simply type cloud, and here is the Google Cloud Shell, and I opened it. Here it is. And in order to reinitialize it, I simply type gcloud init. That will start the process all over again. And eventually my allow screen turned into this screen. You are now authenticated into Google Cloud SDK. All right, let's navigate back to the shell. So we're working in the default project. So in order to do that, let's go ahead and choose three and hit enter. 
After that, it prompts us for a zone and region. I don't care what zone or region it's in, so I'm going to say no. Now we're ready to begin using GSUtil. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on installing the Google Cloud SDK. In this lecture, let's cover working with GSUtil. On GCP, Google Storage offers a classic bucket-based file structure similar to AWS S3 and Azure Storage. The command line tool for working with storage on GCP is GSUtil. Google Storage offers three levels of storage with different accessibility and pricing. The first option is called Standard Storage. This is for fast access to large amounts of data. It offers high-speed response to requests. The second option is called DRA, and it's for long-term storage access and infrequent access. It's priced lower than Standard Storage. Lastly, there's Nearline Storage for infrequent access to your data. All right, let's jump over to the Cloud SDK show. In order to load Cloud SDK locally, type Google in your search box on your Windows laptop and choose the Google Cloud Shell SDK. Once the shell loads, you're ready to start using GSUtil. The first thing to do is set the project you want to work within. We're going to use the project ID in order to set the project. The project ID is in the home page when you're logged into GCP. Next, let's create a bucket using GSUtil's MB. I'm creating a bucket called Mike's Bucket 456. Bucket names reside in a single cloud storage namespace, which means that every bucket name must be unique. Therefore, if I tried to create a bucket called Mike's Bucket, the creation would fail because that bucket already exists. Now, that's a little misleading because it doesn't exist for me anywhere, but it does exist somewhere on GCP. Once the bucket has been created, let's navigate to GCP to ensure that the bucket exists we said earlier in this lecture. Okay, the bucket does exist. Let's create a bucket in a specific region. The code in the example will create a bucket in US East 1. Once a bucket has been created, let's ensure that the bucket exists within our project and the bucket was indeed created in US East 1. All right, that looks good. Since you don't need that bucket, let's go ahead and delete it within the GCP interface. With the next line of code, you're copying a file using the cp command. You're uploading a file called the Titanic CSV from a folder locally called data gcp to a Mike's bucket 456. Let's navigate to the folder where the file was copied to ensure the copy operation worked. All right, that looks good. Access control lists, called ACLs, allow you to control who can read and write your data and even who can read and write the ACLs themselves. ACLs are assigned to objects like files or buckets. In the next line of code, you're granting public access to the Titanic CSV. If we navigate to the folder where the file resides, you can see that the file has been granted public access. In the next line of code, you're going to download all the files in Mike's bucket 456 to the data GCP folder on your local computer. The dash R causes directories, buckets, and bucket subdirectories to be copied recursively. Next, let's clear the screen using CLS. In the next line of code, let's copy the Titanic CSV to another bucket in our project. Let's navigate to the folder where the file was copied to ensure the copy operation worked. All right, that looks good. Let's clean it up by deleting the file within GCP. In the next line of code, you're using the dash M switch. This is a really important switch. This paralyzes the uploading process. That means that all the files stored locally on my laptop in a folder called data GCP will be uploaded in parallel to Mike's bucket 456. During this process, there's a failure uploading the files. You can see that GSUtil started the process over again and after some time was able to upload the files to Mike's bucket 456. Let's peruse the folder on the interface to ensure the files were uploaded to that bucket. All right, everything looks good. Thanks for joining me in this lesson on the basics of cloud storage navigation using GSUtil. Moving large data sets to any cloud provider can be challenging. In this scenario, you'll be moving two data sets to GCP using two separate files from a relational database, then using a union statement to join those on BigQuery. All right, let's jump over to the code. All right, so here we are in a relational database called SQL Server. Here we have a toy database that Microsoft provides for those who want to learn SQL Server called AdventureWorks. 
And here we have a view. And I am segmenting the view into two different sections. And I'm doing that on this key called the business entity ID. I believe if we execute that, we can see that it's fairly equal. Yeah, close enough. So we want to take these views, these subsections of this view, right, this data. We're going to pretend that it's really large. And we're going to export these into two files. Now, this trick will work with any number of files or any number of segments of data you want to use to export to GCP. Let's come over here and right click on our database. We're going to go to All Tasks and we're going to go to Export Our Data. Let's pull this to the middle. Let's click Next. We're going to use SQL Server, so we need to find a connection for our SQL Server and we'll use this one. All right, that looks good from AdventureWorks 2014. Great. Next. We're going to output this to a CSV file, so we want a flat file destination. We're going to browse to a location to put that. This seems like a good one. Sales one, we'll call this. We'll make it a CSV file. We'll hit open. Yep, great. Next. All right, we want to use a query to specify our data. It's the query we've crafted behind here. Actually, the two queries we've crafted, but we can only do one at a time. So we'll click the 1699 to 12,000 first. We'll go next. Let's go ahead and take a look to make sure it looks good. Yep, that's what we want. We'll click next again, finish. And now our data has been copied to that location. Now we're going to do the same thing with this next segment of data. Right click, tasks, and we want to export data. Let's move it to the center. Let's go next. Let's go find our SQL Server connection. The LODB is the one you want to use. There is our database. Let's go ahead and click next. We want a flat file. We're doing the exact same thing we did. Previously, we're just creating a separate file called sales2.csv. Open. Next. Again, we've written a query. It's going to be the second query. Next. Let's go ahead and grab this second query. All right, let's paste that query. Let's hit next. Let's go ahead and preview it. All right, starting with 12,001. That's the second half of our data. Great. Okay. Next, finish, finish. And now we've written out the second group of data to a directory locally on our machine. Now it's time to upload that to GCP. And we need GSU to do that. So we need to go to our cloud SDK. We'll type cloud and we'll hit enter to open the cloud shell. We'll move this to the middle. I've copied the code out so you don't have to see me bang out this. You can see that we're moving sales to. Let's go ahead and move sales to up to our bucket. Bucket that was created previously called Mike's Bucket 32. All right, here we go. Now we're going to move sales one up. Let's open up GCP. Now let's go ahead and take a look at that bucket to make sure that those two files are in there. And they are indeed in there. They've uploaded successfully. There's sales one and sales two. Now what we need to do is move over to BigQuery and upload those into BigQuery. Let's go ahead and navigate to BigQuery. All right, so we're going to put both of those under this project. So let's click on a project. Let's go ahead and click on create a table. All right, now we need to upload from the cloud, right? Not from our local machine anymore. So let's go ahead and click on Google Cloud Storage. We need to browse and find that. Here is our bucket. This will take a little while to paint. We're going to select the Sales 1 CSV. We'll click that. We're going to hit Select. We'll call this Sales 1. All right, we can see that it successfully found that file. Let's go ahead and auto detect our schema. Let's go ahead and create our Sales 1 table. Great. Created the job. Yep, great. Thank you. Let's go ahead and create the Sales 2 table. Under Project again. Let's go ahead to create table. We're doing the exact same thing from Google Cloud Storage and from that same bucket. So let's go hunt that bucket down. And we want to upload the sales to data. This will often take a little while to paint. There we are, sales to, select. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to call it sales to auto detect. Let's go ahead and create. 
And now we have two tables, sales one and sales two. And now we need to combine those. And to do that, we're going to create a join statement, a simple join in SQL to do that. Let's go to query history. Let's go to open up this query. It's already formatted. You can see it's the exact same code. Project name, table name. One is sales one, one is sales two. And we're going to run that to join those two tables together. And that's all there is to uploading two data sets and joining them. Now, if we wanted to, we could create a view out of this. And you can tell them we've created a larger data set from a view you can use to build your machine learning models with. Thanks for joining me in this lecture on segmenting data, moving that data to GCP, and then using Union All to combine that data in BigQuery. In this lecture, let's go ahead and upload a data set to BigQuery. So here we are in our data sets. We have our Titanic project data set. So let's go ahead and create a table and house it under that data set. Go over here to create table. Let's go to our sources and we'll select upload because we're going to upload from a local source, which is my laptop. We'll hit browse. PS Mike, and this is definitely the location of the Titanic file. It is the root directory of my Python install. There it is. Let's go ahead and click on it. We're creating under my first project, correct? The data set name we want to house it under, we've said is the Titanic project. That's good news. We have to give it a name, so let's call it Titanic. The next thing we want to do is auto detect the schema. So this will auto detect the schema from the CSV file. It's a nice feature. We're going to come down here to advanced options, and under advanced options, we're going to say we have headers. Now, it's not really intuitive. You have to come down here and say header rows to skip the first one. We're going to skip the first row because it is the header row. Let's go ahead and create that table now. It'll take a second. The job is created and started. Load job created. Thank you. The table has been created. Let's go over here and query that table. Query table. Let's select all. And that's all there is to it. We've just uploaded the Titanic data set to BigQuery. You can see that the table is housed under Titanic project. And you can see that the headers look correct. Our data looks good. Now we're ready to move on to the next step.